Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you for those kind words of introduction. I'm delighted to be here today at Renewable UK's annual conference. And our location, uh, as Maria was hinting there, is rather appropriate because Manchester was the thumping heart of the first industrial revolution. This was the world's first industrial city. It is home to the first industrial canal and the world's oldest railway station. And the foundations for our prosperity were laid right here. The engines which drove Britain's extraordinary economic growth were built here from the spinning mule to the steam engine. So we could not have picked a better place to discuss their modern equivalents. Renewable energy technologies will deliver a third industrial revolution, and its impact will be every bit as profound as the first two. And my argument today is a simple one. The revolution has already begun. From the Western Isles to the Isle of Wight, across the length and breadth of Britain, new companies are creating new jobs, delivering the technologies that will power our future. And as we look to pull ourselves out of recession and back to prosperity, renewable energy can light the way. And today I want to look at the contribution renewable energy is making to our economy right now. The investment in it is sparkling, the jobs it's delivering, the growth uh, that it is creating. And I will look at what we can do to encourage that growth and to sustain those jobs. But first, I want to take aim at the fault finders and the curmudgeons who hold forth on the impossibility of renewables, the unholy alliance of climate skeptics and armchair engineers who are selling Britain's ingenuity short. Renewables are too expensive, they cry. They cannot deliver energy at scale. They're uneconomic, unreliable, and unwanted. But it's time for us to retire these myths. And let us start with the most egregious, that renewables are too expensive, that they could not exist without public subsidy, that they're held up by government cash alone. Well, last year, global investment in renewable energy rose by 32% to 211 billion US dollars. And 142 billion dollars of that total was new financial investment, which excludes government and corporate R&D. Renewables are grabbing a large and growing share of new energy investment. Yes, some of that investment, of course, is attracted by public subsidy to offset the substantial market failure that we don't take account of carbon. But globally, subsidies for fossil fuels outstrip subsidies for renewables by a factor of five. We subsidize renewables to bring on deployment and reduce costs, and we've seen some remarkable successes. The cost of solar energy, if you look at solar PV, has just gone on tumbling year in and year out. And right now, support for renewable energy costs the average household less than sixpence a day. But decades of underinvestment in energy efficiency and reliance on fossil fuels costs us much, much more. About half of the average household bill goes on wholesale gas and electricity costs. And these costs are highly volatile. And as Ofgem has made clear, the higher gas price is the real reason bills have been going up over the past eight years. And that is why we need a flexible energy portfolio. And that's where the counter-argument of the climate skeptics falls down. Forget wind farms, they say. Shale gas will be our savior. We should abandon everything else. Well, I don't believe instinctively that government is very good at picking winners. If you do, I refer you to the Department of Trade and Industry, that's the predecessor of the Department of Business, white paper from 2004 that estimated that oil prices would reach the astonishing heights of $23 a barrel by 2010. And even last year, somewhat I have to say to my own skepticism, 
My own department forecast oil at $80 a barrel, and Brent crude is currently trading at $110 a barrel. Lashing our economy to a single energy source is a risky business. We don't yet know the full extent of shale gas here, and here is here in Lancashire, how economically or environmentally viable it will be to extract or by when. At best, it is years away. Unconventional gas has not yet lit a single room nor cooked a single roast dinner here in the UK. Yet those who clamor loudest for realistic energy policies would have us hitch our wagon to shale alone. Now, shale gas may be significant. It is exciting, but we do not yet know enough to bet the farm on it. And faced with such uncertainty, uh, it's very clear to me that we should do what any rational investor would do with their own pension fund, and that is that to, to spread our risks and to have a portfolio. And that portfolio has to include renewables. The second fallacy is that renewables cannot deliver energy reliably or at scale. But today, more than 10 gigawatts of our electricity capacity is renewable. That's enough to power 6 million homes. And with every passing year, renewable energy takes over another percentage point of global electricity capacity. In 2007, 5% of the world's electricity was renewable. In 2008, 6%. In 2009, 7%. And last year, 8%. And it's still growing rapidly. More than a third of the new capacity added last year, some 60 gigawatts, was from non-hydro renewables. The message is clear. When we build new power plants, increasingly globally, we choose renewables. In fact, renewable energy can make our system more secure, not less. According to the International Energy Agency, renewables increase the diversity of electricity sources, making energy systems more flexible and more resistant to shocks. Yes, some renewable technologies are intermittent, but the Committee on Climate Change estimate that even with 65% of our energy provided by renewables in 2030, intermittency may cost just one pence per kilowatt hour, one penny per kilowatt hour. After all, biomass is instantly dispatchable, and providing backup for intermittent renewables is just not that expensive. We already swing from a low of demand of 40 gigawatts in the early hours of the morning to a high sometimes of 80 gigawatts during the day. Peking plant has long been part of our electricity mix in the UK. And the reality is uh, that without uh, such peaking plant, uh, the nation's kettles would be cold in the Coronation Street ad breaks. So this is nothing new. Every year, renewable energy is attracting more investment and delivering more capacity. It's also gathering more support. 119 countries out of roughly 200 worldwide have renewable energy targets or policies up from an estimated 55 just six years ago. And that brings me to the third great misconception about renewable energy, that it is unwanted. Earlier this year, the polling organization Ipsos Mori polled 1,000 UK adults on which energy source they preferred. And by a clear margin, people favored renewables. 88% of those polled viewed solar power favorably, 82% for wind, 76% for hydroelectricity, 57% for biomass. The highest placed traditional energy source for electricity was gas at 56%. So 73% of people would support a new wind farm in their area, as opposed to just 21% for a new coal plant. So when you get behind the headlines, 
And I, I do realise on that, of course, that I mean, if I as Energy Secretary could persuade everybody who protested at any new piece of in energy infrastructure to sign a binding undertaking that they wouldn't want any instant access to electricity in their own homes, I think we'd find it a lot easier. Uh, but when you get behind the headlines, you find that support for renewable energy is strong and growing, and so is its contribution to our economy. And across the United Kingdom, renewables are providing jobs, investment, growth. And the numbers are really starting to add up. Over the last financial year, nearly 4,500 new jobs were created in the low carbon sector, which grew by 4.3%. 51,600 companies in Britain provide low carbon and environmental goods and services, and exports are now 11.3 billion, uh, which is a substantial increase. By Christmas, we will have three gigawatts of biomass installed, by Easter, five gigawatts of onshore wind. And in the past seven months alone, plans for 1.69 billion of investment, uh, 1.69 billion pounds of investment and 9,500 jobs have been announced. And here in the Northwest, more than 950 jobs, 340 at the Siemens Renewable Energy Engineering Center, just a few miles down the road from here, up to 600 over the next decade at Camel Laird. Three new farm gen developments planned in Cumbria with hundreds of jobs. This is the reality of green growth. And at a time when closures and cuts dominate the news cycle, next generation industries are providing jobs and investing capital in Britain. And just as in the recovery from the last deep depression in 1929 to 31, it is the new and innovative industries which will grow fastest. And renewable energy is surging out across the UK, blazing a trail of startups and jobs. Across the Pennines in Yorkshire, 2,250 jobs, 130 million in Real Ventures Biomass Plant, employing up to 285 people. In the Northeast, more than 1,400 jobs. Tag Energy Solutions, which I visited recently, delivering up to 400 jobs in the Billingham uh, Turbine Factory. North of the border, one of the jewels in our renewable energy crown, 160 million pounds of new investment and more than 420 Scottish jobs. And across the Irish Sea, 450 jobs in Belfast Harbour, thanks to Dong Energy's Dudden Sands offshore wind farm. 1,400 jobs uh, in Wales. In the heart of England, 100 jobs in the East Midlands, 50 in the West, 120 in East Anglia, 2,200 jobs in the South East, supported by 172 million pounds from Vestas, uh, the Green Home Company, and more. And at Tilbury, the first UK coal plant to convert completely to biomass, safeguarding livelihoods there. Across Britain, from the industrial heartlands to the northernmost extremities, new energy technologies are delivering jobs and growth just when we need them most, capitalizing on our geographical, physical, and human advantages. Scotland's research and natural resources, the Solent's marine expertise, manufacturing in the Northeast, technology development in the M4 corridor. Renewable energy doesn't just have the potential to bring Britain's economy back to life, it has already started. And our job now is to allow it to really flourish. How? By setting clear and coherent objectives and using regulation and closely targeted support to hit them. By the end of this decade, we must cut our carbon emissions by 34% on 1990 levels. And by the end of the next decade, they must be halved. And to hit our EU renewable energy target, which is legally binding, we must generate 30% of our electricity from renewables by 2020. That means a four-fold increase in deployment. We must turn our back on the inheritance that we had from the last Labour government that ranked us uh, as the dunce in class, 25th out of 27 EU member states for renewables. Now, growth on that kind of scale will not be easy. It will require tough decisions, clear thinking, and tightly focused support. And everyone has a part to play. Industry must carry on making the case for renewables. 
engaging with communities and answering its critics by delivering renewable schemes that save money and save carbon. Government must break through the barriers that are stopping new schemes being built, overcoming the financial planning and delivery hurdles that can hold up progress on renewables. And I'll do my bit by saying loud and clear that I think, for example, onshore wind uh, is beautiful. When I said that, I was booed on any questions. Uh, what you didn't hear is that when Jonathan Dimbleby uh, then asked, he thought I'd add to my embarrassment afterwards, uh, by uh, conducting a poll. This was a, a, an audience in Wooten under Edge in Gloucestershire, very near a controversial onshore wind uh, farm development. And he thought it would add to my embarrassment by clearly showing a massive against uh, vote in the audience. And about 40% put their hands up against uh, onshore wind, and about the same number put their hands up in favour. And I have to say the panel was gobsmacked. So there is much more support. It may be less vocal, it may be quieter, but there's much more support out there than I think some of us uh, recognize uh, on the basis of the noise that some of the protesters make. And together, we have to do a better job of communicating. That means engaging with the communities who stand to benefit and the investors who don't yet see the promise that renewable energy holds. We must ensure that the silent majority aren't drowned out by the vocal minority those opposed to renewable energy in all its forms. Indeed, I have to say, those opposed sometimes seems to me to any type of energy in all its forms. And that means making sure communities which host renewables benefit more directly. That's what our proposals on business rate retention are for. And that's why we are, were pleased to endorse Renewable UK's protocol on community benefits. And my challenge to you today is this. Keep it up continue to develop and publicize new ways of rewarding those communities most affected by development. Because, as the report that you're publishing today shows, the opportunities are simply too great to ignore. Globally, around half a trillion dollars has been earmarked for green stimulus spending. And we will need to spend 100 times that by 2050 to hit our climate targets. And we must be realistic. The pressure on the public finances means that we cannot support everything at the level that we otherwise would. So we must ensure that we send clear market signals, deploying public finance intelligently and breaking through barriers to growth. And our starting point is simple. We have a responsibility to the taxpayer and to the bill payer to get the most carbon and cost-effective electricity generation online. And that's why the Renewables Obligation Banding Review studied carefully how much subsidy different technologies really need. And the Renewables Obligation reinforces our commitment to renewables. And it provides what developers most need, a stable framework as we look ahead to the electricity market reform. And where new technologies desperately need help to reach the market, where they can be scaled up significantly while bringing down costs over time, we are raising support. Where investors are on the cusp, we will give them the short-term impetus that they need. So marine energy projects up to 30 megawatts will receive five rocks under our plans. And where market costs are coming down, in onshore wind, for example, we're consulting on reducing the subsidy. On offshore wind, we set our ambition high in our recent renewable energy roadmap. And because we want to see a huge increase in deployment by 2020, we must see costs coming down. So we're working to help bring investors and developers together, for example, through the offshore wind uh, investor conference. And uh, one of our hosts today, Andrew Jameson, is also lending his talents to the Offshore Wind Cost-Cutting Task Force, as Maria uh, just pointed out, and it met for the first time last week. And on biomass, our support will focus more strongly on cheaper transitional technologies. Conversion from coal to biomass, for example, exploits existing assets and helps build the supply chain here in the UK. And overall, the new arrangements will mean a lower impact on consumer bills, a lower impact on consumer bills than staying with the current bandings. And in total, 
and this is absolutely key, our low carbon and energy saving policies will reduce household energy bills compared with a do nothing policy. If we just stood back and let the market rip, we anticipate, given the likely development of oil and gas prices, that British households would end up paying more than they will with our low carbon and energy saving policies. Now, on the renewables uh, banding review, this is, of course, a consultation. We want to hear views from industry and beyond, and I'm sure you will not be backwards in coming forward. Our approach to renewable energy must encourage investment and deliver value for money for consumers. And we're doing three things to help. First, we're using policy to create new markets that will stimulate new investment, like the Green Deal being launched next October, our unprecedented energy efficiency program, and the first of its kind in the world. It will bring jobs, growth, and opportunities right the way across this country. Or the first, uh, first uh, renewable heat incentive uh, in the world. It will create a whole new market in renewable heat, not just big industrial and commercial installations, but also homes and businesses too, being piloted this year and then rolled out next. And we expect green capital investment in heat to rise by 7.5 billion in 2020, supporting 150,000 manufacturing supply chain and installer jobs. So the first thing we're doing is to create new markets. The second is to make existing markets work better. That's why we published in the summer our plans for the reform of the electricity market, which will deliver secure, low carbon, and affordable electricity. And we've listened to the renewables industry in drawing up those reforms. And that's why we support a contract for difference model tailored to renewables and not auctioning in the near future, although that remains a longer term goal. We'll publish a technical update on the institutional framework and the capacity mechanism around the turn of the year. And we're planning to provide more information on the contract for differences as well. We'll also build in a phased transition from the renewables obligation to the new arrangements. By offering certainty and clarity, we can secure the scale of investment that we need. And by attracting in new investors, we will also increase competition in the UK energy market. Now, our third priority is to capture the benefits of the low carbon revolution here in the UK. That means ensuring more clean technologies are designed and manufactured here. We have a blossoming low carbon goods and services sector, which seems to be thriving even in tough times. But China now leads the world in solar photovoltaic panel production, Germany on energy efficient housing design. We're missing a trick unless we start supporting low carbon manufacturing here in Britain and grow the green supply chain, locking in profits and expertise and creating the exports that will keep Britain competitive for decades to come. Yes, climate change is a man-made disaster. And yes, the UK does produce just 2% of global carbon emissions. But if we grasp the opportunity now, our businesses and our economy can be much more than 2% of the solution. We are not going to save our economy by turning our back on renewable energy. This has been at the heart of Liberal Democrat policy thinking for decades. And it's something that the Deputy Prime Minister, the Business Secretary, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury instinctively understand. But this goes beyond any one party. I know the Prime Minister agrees, which is why he's putting so much effort into securing offshore wind manufacturing in the UK. And it's something I know that my predecessor, Ed Miliband, understands. And it's the, this three-party consensus that makes the UK such a good place to invest. It wasn't always like that. It's nothing short of a national disgrace that in the 1980s the UK lost our leading wind research position to Denmark because government refused to support the industry. And it's a mistake I'm determined that this coalition government will not repeat. And that's why in the recent rock banding consultation, I have sent a clear signal to the tidal stream and the wave industry, 
We want the UK to be the best place in the world to invest, deploy, and commercialize these technologies. So I can today assure you that this government has resolved that we will be the largest market in Europe for offshore wind. We already have more installed offshore wind than anywhere else in the world, and we are determined to remain at the forefront and that's why we set aside 200 million pounds for the development of low carbon technologies in the comprehensive spending review, including 60 million pounds for supporting major new manufacturing projects on the English coast. We will be the best place to invest in marine power, and we will be the fastest growing country in the EU when it comes to renewable deployment. And that's why the Green Investment Bank has been capitalized with three billion pounds to help unlock private sector investment at scale. And don't underestimate the achievement uh, with the Green Investment Bank. For the first time ever in our economic history, Britain will join every other leading developed economy in having our own public development bank, which is focused on key economic goals. And that's why we'll keep funding research and innovation, not just through DEC, but through the business and transport departments as well. We're also funding the Offshore Wind Accelerator, a partnership between the Carbon Trust and leading developers to demonstrate a new generation of full-scale, low-cost energy. And I'm pleased to announce today that a project funded through the Accelerator has been successfully installed uh, with a MET mast by the Smart Wind Consortium with funding support from Dong Energy. And this kind of innovation will bring down the cost of offshore wind even more quickly. And that's why we've allocated up to 30 million pounds over the next four years to fund innovation to reduce offshore wind costs. And as part of this work, our first call for proposals will focus on components of emerging offshore wind systems with a budget of up to five million pounds, and I expect it to be launched shortly. We've also allocated up to 20 million pounds to support the world's first commercial scale marine energy arrays, and we're working closely with organizations such as the Energy Technologies Institute, who just announced plans to invest up to 25 million in an offshore wind floating system demonstration project, opening up new areas off the coast of the UK and helping to bring generation costs down. So from the structure of the electricity market to research funding, we're breaking through the economic barriers, but we're also focusing on non-financial obstacles. We're reforming the planning system to ensure that it's no longer a break on sustainable development. The Energy National Policy Statement set out the national need for new renewable energy infrastructure, and we've introduced a fast-track process for consents and we will close the Infrastructure Planning Commission and return decisions on major energy infrastructure to democratically elected ministers. More than 1,000 pages of local planning policy for England are being replaced by clearer and more streamlined national planning policy framework, and the government will consult on measures for a planning guarantee. We're also working to improve grid connections, the Connect and Manage scheme is now up and running. Network companies are now looking much further ahead in their planning and engaging more effectively with stakeholders. And together, this will help the network act as a facilitator rather than as an obstacle to renewable generation. And a few months ago, we published the Renewables Roadmap, setting out for the first time how we will overcome barriers to deployment. It's a comprehensive action plan to accelerate the UK's deployment and use of renewable energy. So in many ways, Britain can lay claim to be the home of renewable energy. It's thought that the oldest tidal mill in the world once stood on the River Fleet in London. The White Cliffs of Dover looked over a tide mill that was recorded in the Doomsday Book. And 130 years ago, we connected the world's first public electricity supply in Godalming, in Surrey. And it did not burn coal or gas. No, the power plant in question was a Siemens generator driven by 100% clean renewable power, a water mill 
on the River Way. When Britain began its journey towards electrification, renewable energy was the future. We ended up choosing another path, but this time things will be different. We will not heed the naysayers or the green economy deniers. With more than 200 billion pounds worth of energy infrastructure needed by the end of this decade, this is our golden chance to deliver a greener future. Thank you.